Welcome to Canada Files. I'm Valerie Pringle. Moshe Safdie is one of the world's most iconic and inventive architects. He's created projects ranging from Habitat, the housing complex at Expo 67 in Montreal, to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, to the Marina Bay Sands Resort in Singapore. He's written of his 60 years designing buildings around the world in his memoir, If Walls Could Speak, My Life in Architecture. And what a life it has been. Mr. Safdie, hello. Hi, how are uh, you? I'm well. Um, may we start with Habitat? Uh, it was such a phenomenon. You were a baby in your 20s. It was your architectural school thesis that you built this amazing um, residential community at Expo 67 in Montreal. You've described it as a fairy tale. I mean, it, it, it was a fairy tale beginning to your career. Well, what's interesting is at the time, it seems inevitable, it's going to happen. I was driven. Uh, and now that I look back, I say, how the hell did he get it done? Uh, how did they get it done? I mean, a whole group of young people who formed my office that had just been born for the project. And you walk around the project today, 50 years later, um, it stands up well. It's uh, as we could say, living happily ever after as a sound community. But when you think back on all the obstacles, the technical obstacles, the political obstacles, it is a kind of a fairy tale. Well, you ended up on the cover of Newsweek. You were an instant kind of architectural star. You invented the stacked washer dryer. I mean, honestly, this was revolutionary. It's true that there was kind of this kind of springing to the top of the hill. but. Right after, there were many commissions for other habitats, Habitat New York, Puerto Rico, Washington, uh, Tehran, and none of them got built. But now, so, more habitats coming to it. Are people finally cycles. catching up to you? Yeah, so a lot of, for a long time, habitat was ignored. You know, it's a one-timer. It's not something going to replicate. And then all of a sudden, in the last 20 years, interest in housing, sustainability, green buildings, all of a sudden the young generation, the next generation is, is embracing this and I'm seeing many habitats of various forms being even in Toronto. So you were right. Very satisfying. Well, if you, I guess it's nice to live long enough to see and enjoy it. But the <clears throat> underpinning of habitat, you know, which I love this expression, that was behind your thinking you say was for everyone a garden that came from your childhood in Haifa, growing up? Well, you know, I grew up in a very special environment, not only historically, the state in the making, but it, Haifa is a beautiful city on the hillside. Uh, we were educated to be self-sufficient. We had a little farm. I had my bees, I had my chicken, we had our eggs. And next door were the Baha'i Gardens, which are one of the most beautiful gardens in the world, Persian gardens, where the Baha'i religion is, 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 is centered. The, the founder is buried there, and they come for pilgrims. So, so that, but the most beautiful garden in the world was my backyard, and I, I was obsessed with, uh, with gardens, which then became kind of a, a, a motto, a metaphor that comes through my work beyond habitat even, I mean, beyond housing. That, you know, now they've created the, the Jewel Complex in Singapore Airport, which is the biggest garden under glass as a kind of an urban place. The scale jumps at the Sky Park at uh, Marina Bay Sands. So gardens have kind of been a major theme in my work, right through housing, workspace, museums, libraries. It's, it's the centerpiece of some theme. And again, you know, as we saw during COVID, I mean, people, people craved that, people needed that. You know, where's my outdoor space? Where's my public space? Where's my, where's my garden? There is a major shift because of COVID in the emphasis on outdoor space, on opening windows, on even a balcony, which would not be provided maybe earlier. And people, I remember someone calling me from New York, a friend, uh, uh, an urban planner living in a luxury building with a doorman and everything. 
uh, and, and bemoaning during, during COVID, can't open my windows, I don't have an outdoor space, I'm going nuts. And that's luxury housing, that's not low-income housing. And so now I think we've come full circle and understand that not just about the living space, but about the workspace. You know, office buildings, one acre footprint, where 80% of the people don't see a window all day, are on the way out. <clears throat> I don't think we're gonna build many more. In Europe, it's already legislated. You've gotta be so many meters away from a window. Um, you ought to be able to have outdoor space that people can go out, not just for smoke, but for just for fresh air. So I think we're seeing a kind of a shift of return, I'd say, to the significance and beauty and nourishing qualities of, of nature. You have spent a huge amount of your career building in Israel. You talked about Yad Vashem um, being the most challenging and symbolically demanding because, you know, of the responsibility you had in creating this and, and because it was personal as well. Yad Vashem, I mean, I talk in, in the memoir about those projects which demand rising to another level. I talk about music and architecture. I talk about the fact that I often wondered as an architect, can we, through architecture, rise to the emotion level that we get from music? I used to think that that's not possible, actually, that music is sublime and we can't. But when it comes to projects like Yad Vashem, or any memorial or something which has a whole history to it or national identity, I think that's where an architect can, can, can rise. And it, in, in Yad Vashem, it was a place that has to tell the most horrific story that maybe occurred in human history. And at the same time, you can't leave the visitor down in the dungeon, in, 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 in the death camps. So part of the architecture was to take you underground into a series of galleries in which this, the narrative unfolds. But slowly that underground structure starts climbing out towards the light. And at the end, you reach the point where you come out of the mountain and you're overlooking the Jerusalem forest. And for me, this was like we prevailed. You know, we are here alive and we prevailed. And this was very controversial, particularly amongst the, the survivors of the death camps who were, some of them were on the building committee, who could not share this kind of optimistic statement at the end. But almost everyone who comes to Yad Vashem, at the moment they come out to this mo point where you are hovering over the forest, having gone through that, the whole story of the Holocaust, it's, it's almost a moment of rebirth, you know? And, and so in that sense, you have a moment there, which I suppose you could say made it, made it up to music, maybe. One of the more extraordinary stories is that at the opening of Yad Vashem, in the lineup for the men's bathroom, you run into Sheldon Adelson, Mr. Las Vegas developer, who goes, you know, nice job, Moshe, would you like to design Marina Bay Sands Resort in Singapore, which you, you say you know, is one of the most successful buildings of the 21st century and one of the most significant projects of your career, but totally the opposite. I mean, Complete this is the crazy rich Asians opposite. building. That was quite an adventure. First, there was very little time left to design it. We designed and built it in four years. I couldn't think of more unlike people in, in, in history and in conviction and political beliefs uh, than the two of us, but we managed somehow to cooperate, maybe under the shadow of the Singapore government who had very clear objectives as to what it wanted. And the fact of the matter is this building has become the symbol of Singapore. It's become, in fact, the symbol of almost Southeast Asia. <laughs> it's, it's like the, the Sydney Opera House, uh, on the newscast, on the, so. Um, you must have loved that movie, Crazy Rich Asians, though, because that took it to another that, level. That, that movie took it to the level of pop culture. And <laughs> as people sometimes ask me, 
uh, oh, you're an architect, what if you design? I said, did you, did you see the movie? <laughs> and that's, most, many people have seen that movie. And well, they want to know, movie. like, when did you figure out you were going to put that pool on top and create a sky park? I mean, you say you just put a piece of balsa wood on the model and went, Why that's not? where it'll go. Why not? Yeah, it did evolve that way. I mean, it was not part of an initial plan. We needed space for the parks and the swimming pools, and it was very dense. And there were three hotels linearly arranged, and there was a big piece of balsa wood in the workshop, in our model shop, where everything, all the good things happened. And at some point, I just lifted it. Some of the clients, people were there, and said, there it is. And... Uh, I won't say what Mr. Adelson said when he first saw it. It took some time to convert him, but uh, um, but um, everybody recognized that's a winner because this was a competition. We had to win it, competing with other developers, each with their own architect. So, so I'm I'm figuring the best review you ever got was from the little boy who came into the National Gallery of Canada. <laughs> you know, after you'd built that and said, it, yes. does God live here? It was in the Great Hall. It was the, the week of the opening. Maybe it was the day, of the, the, the day after the formal opening. And my wife, Michal, and I were climbing up the ramp and arrived at the Great Hall. And there was this kid with his mother. And they were right next to us. And he looked up onto the sails and the whole roof, ceiling, dome of the great hall. He says, uh, Mama, does God live up there? And I mean, to me, that was, that was again a musical moment. Well, you talk about magic in buildings. I mean, I guess you can't achieve it every time. No, you can't. But you got to be shooting for it. I think, I think there is buildings that work and buildings that don't work. And that's quite one of the things I try and develop in the memoir is to give lay people the tools about evaluating architecture. I mean, you know, is this a good school? If it's a school, is that is that a good opera house? I mean, and there's criteria, you know, how's the sound, how's the sight lines, what's the experience, you know. But then there's beyond that, that element that that touches us emotionally and that touches us in a way that that is lasting and that is when architecture transcends and that's what you aim for and spirituality is not just something you aim for as an architect i think when you're doing a, a significant public building i think i think there's something about spirituality when designing a residential complex there's, there's, there's something about uplifting the human spirit, making, making people fe feel good about themselves through the architecture as they experience it. And that's a subtle thing, but it's, it's central. As is the power of place, which you spend a lot of time talking about. The power of place in this globalizing world where everything is becoming the same has become really central to... to a, and and it's, it's a lesson I... I, I, I got from building in Jerusalem, because when I came to Jerusalem right after Habitat, 1967, 68, 70, there's a rich his history of its architecture. I mean, there's a heritage there. And you can't just come and do contemporary buildings, you know, glass and steel in the middle of all that history. And so one of my objectives became, if I succeed in designing contemporary buildings in Jerusalem that, that you won't be able to answer the question as it was put to me by one, one, the client, will it be a modern or traditional building? It just needs to belong. And, and therefore, it, its concept is rooted in place. And that became a motto. National Gallery did its best to relate to neo-Gothic, Nordic, called Ottawa. Uh, and later on, the Sikh Museum had to feel to the Sikhs like it belongs to them. That's part of the, the heritage of Sikh architecture and art and culture and belong there. And that meant I had to become a bit of a chameleon. Rather than 
the architect with the power of signature, design signature that you bring from place to place. There's, there's my building here. They're, they're recognizable and, re and sort of imported and repeated that it's really important to have a building belong. And as you do that, you need to understand the place more deeply. You need to relate to what the materials, to the traditions. And you know, in that sense, it's not just that China is different to the United States, is different to say Israel or to Senegal, but that, you know, Boston is different from New York and Chicago is different from Los Angeles. And, and every site has its secrets that you need to decipher. And also the other part of architecture you say that just gives you a little shiver of happiness is to actually see your buildings starting to go up. Do you say the feelings and, are... And the greatest is when the people move in for the first time. Like we just inaugurated the medical school uh, in Sao Paulo in Brazil. And because of COVID, I was not able to go there during construction. And I only saw it through cameras as they were building. And then students moved in before I ever got to see the building. So by the time I arrived to Sao Paulo a few months ago, the students were already in the building. And that was like miraculous experience. You didn't see it evolve. You just see them in there already working, going to the classes, looking at the plants of the garden. It was wonderful. Um, you're interesting about airports. You've, you've built a few, Pearson in Toronto, Ben Gurion in Israel, Jewel Changi you've talked about in Singapore. Um, you say airports everywhere are banishing comfort, reason, efficiency, and delight. And they are. They're horrible. The nightmares, most of them. So, you know, I mean, you're pretty harsh about America and infrastructure well, in I the U.S. The, the state of U.S. infrastructure is, is tra tragic. Um, and it's, there, it's, it's, it's in terrible shape for many, many reasons. I mean, it's depriving it of the funding, it's lack of pride of place. Um, it, you know, recently uh, when the bill passed in the Senate and Congress to fund infrastructure, the infrastructure bill, everybody got excited. We're going to get bullet trains. We're going to get this. We're going to get new airports. We're going to get sound bridges. And I wrote an article uh, in which I say, hold your breath. It's not going to happen unless we change our ways, unless we change the way we get projects approved unless we cut the time by which you can get approvals, unless we negotiate with labor to work around the clock, different shifts. You can't build bullet trains and, and bridges and, and all the things that come with infrastructure at the little minuscule pace that we do work. But Asia's building all this crazy stuff. Do they just dream bigger? Or? They dream bigger, they fund bigger, and they work hard physically physically work hard. The labor force works hard, but also works differently. When we built Marina Bay Sands, six million square feet, we built it in four years. But that meant three shifts, seven days a week. Now you could say, you know, we don't do this in the United States. We have unions, we have this. It's all a matter of negotiating. I mean, some people work nights, some people work daytimes. It's, it, it's possible to negotiate. We do not take the means, we don't provide the means, and we don't seem to have to real conviction and commitment. And I think this is very detrimental to the growth of the economy and to the well-being of everyone. And Canada just is a little ahead, not much ahead, but a little ahead than the United States in that respect. When you look at your career, you seem to have had a really rare ability. I mean, there are lots of architects who are international architects. You meet them in all the competitions and you know. Um, do you think you're getting better as you get older? I think I'm getting better in the sense that there are tools that come to you with experience that you don't have earlier in life. I mean, for example, I used to have to sit and draw and sketch as I designed. In other words, as I imagine, I'm drawing. But I can go for a swim now and think through a building as I'm swimming. I love the image of you, you swimming know. on Walden Pond. You're very disciplined. Uh, I'm very disciplined about my swimming and in fact I have to be careful because if I get too lost in thoughts and I'm in a pool 
I hit my head going, going into it because I've, I've, I've lost my, I lost myself in thought. But, uh, but it's interesting that you get to the point where now I understand how musicians can compose when they're deaf or when they're not listening to the music, but just imagining in the music. So these are tools that you get with experience. On the other hand, uh, there's something about the enthusiasm of, of, uh, of youth, which I enjoy, enjoyed experiencing, but now I enjoy watching as a teacher, which I am, and just see the enthusiasm that, that comes when you're just beginning at it. But you still have you know, so many ideas. What are our cities without automobiles? How do we change the way we live? How do we design and change for the future and you know, greater sustainability? And I mean, you, you have to. You, you walk around and you see how things could be better, you know? How, how things could function better. I mean, it's totally ridiculous that we own vehicles individually. I do several, so I sh I'm, I'm guilty. You love your uh, Citroën. <laughs> but, but when you think about it, for example, if we had cars on demand instead of owning them, we'd cut the number of cars by two-thirds right away, right there, and we still are able to drive when we want, how we want. So there are even not drastic measures. We don't, even if we don't wait for self-driving vehicles or, or things that maybe the future will bring or will bring, not maybe, still, you, you walk around as an urbanist and as an architect and you keep saying, why, why is it that way? Why can't we improve on it? Mm -hmm. Not to mention walking into a school that looks like a prison instead of a place for learning, you know? I mean, oh, so many things like that. Yeah. I think actually the test for architecture, for an architect, is to completely identify with those you're designing for, that you become them. And, and you experience the building through what they will experience, whether it's a school or a concert hall or, or a house. And that takes a certain deep humility. And so I'd say, if I describe myself as an architect, is that I become, I can become, I can become the, the kind of eyes and ears of those of, for whom I'm designing. You have wrote a poem which you include in your book, which is sort of your credo, I guess. May I get you to read it? Yes, I wrote this poem in 1980. I happen to have been in Jerusalem, but it's not specifically about that. And I was summing up my feelings about architecture in the midst of this postmodern architecture debate. And so, he who seeks truth shall find beauty. He who seeks beauty shall find vanity. He who seeks order shall find gratification. He who seeks gratification shall be disappointed. He who considers himself the servant of his fellow beings shall find the joy of self-expression. He who seeks self-expression shall fall into the pit of arrogance. Arrogance is incompatible with nature. Through the nature, through nature, the nature of the universe and the nature of man, we shall seek truth. If we seek truth, we shall find beauty. And it still holds true for you? Absolutely. So, I don't know how I came to write it so precisely, but it's my only poem. Um, but I uh, absolutely believe in what, it's, what it implies. What does being Canadian mean to you? It means a great deal to me. Um, I feel that Canada was first where I became an architect, where I had my first opportunity as an architect. But I also feel that Canada has been very generous to me in many, at many levels. That Think about it, this, uh, a recent graduate of architecture, 25 years old, making a proposal to build this real radical building making it to civil servants who then support him, approve it, take him to the, to the federal cabinet to present it to the prime minister and to the cabinet. I mean, this, this is the kind of uh, uh, support that I'm very grateful and that's been consistent. Mm -hmm. Well, you hold three passports. 
Israel of my birth, Canada and the US. I probably could get a Singapore one if I asked for it. <laughs> I mean, I thought that whoever uh, picked the title for the exhibition of my work, Global Architect, hit right on it. At this point, I'm kind of a global citizen. Well, we're proud of you, obviously, as Canadians. <laughs> and, uh, and your career has been remarkable. I mean, so many stories in here, and obviously still so much work to be done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. And we'll be back next week with another episode of Canada Files. The preceding program was made possible through the generous support of Mary Davy, as well as the following donors. Ted and Alice Kernahan, the Browning Watt Foundation, David and Cheryl Carr, Jim and Sandra Pitbledu, Tony and Sherry Fell, Bryce and Nikki Douglas, Richard Wernham and Julia West, Charles and Marilyn Bailey, Michael McCain and family, Richard Pulisoff, Clench House Foundation, Kathy and George Dombrowski, the 63 Foundation, and by the Central Canadian Public Television Association.